Amen. Amen. Open your Bibles with me to the Gospel record of John again at chapter 11. The last in our series of sermons, the absolute power of Jesus. John at chapter 11, verse 25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. Thank you. You may be seated. <clears throat> the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. The absolute power of Jesus. John chapter 11 presents the seventh and greatest sign of the absolute power of Jesus. The signs, the miracles, that point towards his divinity, his deity, his being the Son of God, starts with a family and ends with a family. Starts at a wedding and ends at a funeral. Starts with life's happiest occasion and ends with life's saddest occasion. In Cana of Galilee, he turns water into wine. In Bethany, the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, he turns death into life. Jesus has some friends, a place where he stops in. As a matter of fact, in John's gospel at chapter 11, it will be three months before Jesus goes to Calvary. But every time he's in this area, he takes a breather, a moment of respite, at the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. They are his ride or die, go-to friends. He doesn't hear any gossip. He doesn't hear any mess. He turns in because these are his friends. Are you his friend? Does he have a seat at your table? Does he have a place in your plans? He turns in to be with his friends. And Jesus is a day's journey, 25 miles away from where they are now. And he gets the word the Lazarus, the one who you love, is sick. Sick in that he is sinking fast. If you don't hurry, he's going to die. The one that you love is sick. Mary and Martha send Jesus that message knowing that even if he does not come, 
he can heal right where he is. But surely, he will come. Because the one who you love is sick. You've been eating at my table. You've been enjoying fellowship in our home. And if you're going to come to see about anybody, you're going to come to see about Lazarus. But Jesus gets that word and he does not move. Lazarus is sick. And Jesus says, this sickness will not end in death. But Lazarus is sick so that the glory of God might be revealed. Jesus said, Lazarus is just sleeping. And the disciples said, well, if he's sleeping, let's just leave him alone. Jesus said, no, he's dead, but I'm glad for your sake. For the benefit of those who don't believe, Lazarus is dead so that the glory of God might be made manifest, not just in Lazarus' life, but that everybody may know that I am the Son of God. But there's a problem in the text. Lazarus is sick, and Jesus is a day's journey away. Mary and Martha sent a messenger to tell Jesus that the one whom you love is sick. It takes him a day to get to where Jesus is. Jesus gets that word. He knows that Lazarus is dead. And Jesus delays another two days. I can see Martha now. Every hour on the hour, opening the curtain to see if Jesus is coming. Mary is about to pull her hair out of her head because she's the more emotional of the two, but, but Martha has cleaned that house so much you can't, you can't find anywhere to sit down. She's, she's even washing the cushions on the sofa, waiting for Jesus to come because he knows that Lazarus is sick. He knows that we are waiting for him. He knows how anxious I am. He knows how nervous I am. He better get here soon or this boy is gonna die. Four days have passed by. Lazarus is now in the grave, stinking. And yonder comes Jesus. Because brothers and sisters, Jesus often will not show up until every hope is gone. Every pillar has been removed. Every answer has been unanswered. Everything you can do has been done. And once you do everything you can do, he shows up to let you know there was nothing you could do. I've prayed and I cried. I fasted and I wept. But sometimes he will not show up until all hope is gone to let you know that unless he shows up, all hope is gone. Somebody ought to help me preach it. He did not turn water into wine until all the wine was gone. And the governor said, you saved the best wine for the last. Now, the problem for Mary and Martha and many of us who are Christian is that God too many times delays. The name it and claim it people say he, he'll, he'll, he'll come when you call him. 
if you, if you pay and sow a seed and, and got a prayer cloth and you've been to a conference and you've got bishop's books all you got to do is name it and claim it but God says I don't work in time I move in eternity I'm not locked into your watch you can watch the clock all you want I show up when I get ready to show up because God is sovereign and in his sovereignty he doesn't owe you an explanation God does whatever pleases him God does whatever he wants to do walk with me around the text because he delays does not mean he's indifferent We make the mistake of focusing on the pain and not the purpose. Because if you are God's child, there's a purpose in your pain. And God loves you so much that he will not waste your pain. He does not always put you in the classroom that looks like your calling. Because the classroom may look different from the lesson. I don't think I'm getting that over to you. Trouble and trial, sorrow and burden, setback and pain, is prolonged for the same reason it was sent in the first place. You have to soak dirty laundry in detergent for a long time to get the stain out. You can't go through the rinse cycle and come out better you got to press deep clean. And sometimes our mess is so messy, God's got to press deep clean. And when he gets through deep cleaning, he got to send us back through the rinse cycle. And then when we come out, he looks to see if we got it. Then he put us back and press deep clean and put us in the rinse cycle. And when we come out, we are pure because we learned the lesson God sent to teach us in the first place. And if you're still in it, it's because you ain't soaked long enough. He loves you. He's going to provide for you. He's going to take care of you. He just wants to get that stain out of you. Now some of y'all acting like you ain't ever fell from grace. Some of you are acting like you've never had a fall where you needed God to deep clean you. I need about six or seven folk here who know if the Lord hadn't shown up, I'd be in prison this morning. Listen, he had Mary and Martha to wait. And he has me and you to wait. Because our will must be bent until they coincide with God's will. And for my will to coincide with God's will takes time. 
I'm, I'm, I'm scared of people who have quick answers who ain't been through nothing. You, you, can't, you can't sing amazing grace with tears in your eyes until you know how amazing God's grace is. You can't shout with enthusiasm about the forgiveness of God until you've had to be forgiven. You can't raise your hands in hallelujah about the grace and the goodness and the mercy of God until you have hit rock bottom to find out that God is the rock at the bottom. He's a way maker. He's a problem solver. He's a burden lifter. And that's why we Christians shout when we hear it. Yeah. Lift up your heads. Yeah. O ye gates. Yeah. And be lifted up. Ye yeah. everlasting door. Yeah. And the king of glory. Yeah. Shall. Yeah. Come in. The king of glory, the Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in the battle. If God has ever had to fight your battles, if God has ever had to open a door for you, if God has ever had to put you through the rinse cycle. Come on, tell your neighbor, please be patient with me. God is not through with me yet. I'm still going through the rinse cycle. I still got some decisions I wish I had made. I still got some doors I wish I'd never walked through. Thank you for grace. Yeah. Let me, let, let, let me give you some, let me give you some pastoral advice that has come from years of experience. Don't, don't listen to these little preachers who start preaching night before last. Let me give you some pastoral advice from almost 47 years of ups and downs in ministry, in church, in pastoring, in, in trying to walk like a Christian. You, 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 have to, you, you have to be careful right here because you need to let God bend you before he has to break you. Because bending you is discipline. Breaking you is judgment. And I don't want God's judgment in my life. I want God's discipline in my life. Because if he judges me, he breaks me, and I may never get back together. But if he bends me, he conforms me to his will because we are his children. And if you belong to God, he will conform you until he makes you look just like Jesus. Now look at how, how he deals with, with Mary and Martha. Four days, Lazarus is stinking. He's decomposed. I almost missed this. Thank you, Holy Ghost, for bringing me back to this. Jesus resuscitated three people in the scripture. 
Jairus' daughter, the son of the widow of Nain, and Lazarus. He brought all three of them back from the dead. Each of them have something in common. They were all dead. It is just a matter of the degree of decomposition. Jairus' daughter just died. The son of the widow of Nain had been dead seven hours. Lazarus had been dead four days. But there's no such thing as a degree of dead. Dead is dead. Somebody gonna help me preach here. All of us in here without Christ are dead. It does not matter the degree of dead, it's a degree of decay. How rotten are you? How decomposed are you? Ephesians chapter 2 says we were dead. I wish I had a Bible reader. In trespasses and sins. But Jesus quickened us. Made us alive through his blood on the cross. Four days. Lazarus is dead. That's the problem. But look with me as I hurry at the power. Jesus gets there and Mary and Martha have two totally different responses. And Jesus does not chide either one of them for how they respond because everybody reacts to death differently. Some people cry, some people sit quietly. If you're in my family, you knock all the flowers down in front of the casket. And they gotta bring you to the hospital and give you a shot or, or somebody gotta get some tequila out the trunk and give it to you so you can pull yourself together. I'm talking about my family. You, you worry about your family, I'm talking about my family. Martha, <laughs> come, come on y'all, quit acting silly. Now let's get back to the text. Martha hears that Jesus just made it. And Martha comes out and says the same thing Mary says, but they have different responses. Mary, the one who anointed his head with expensive perfume, Mary is at his feet weeping so uncontrollably, read it in the scripture, they have to console her. Martha is standing up with her hands on her hips. You know, you, you know how the oldest one acts in the family. Martha is obviously the oldest because the oldest thinks she can run everything. Everybody in here who is the oldest in your family, raise your hand, raise your hand. See how bossy they are? They did just what I told them to do. They want you to know, yeah, I'm the oldest. What you gonna do about it? Martha got her hands on her hip, dish towel on her shoulder, and she said, now Lord, listen, You know I love you. And if I didn't love you, I wouldn't tell you this. But I sent for you four days ago. And if you had have been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus said, Martha, Martha, Martha. 
you're going to see your brother again. She said, I know I'm going to see him again. In the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus now got her right where he wants her. He said to her, Martha, you're looking at what you're looking for. You talking to what you're talking about. You're standing by what you're standing on. I am. I am. Here it is. The King James says the resurrection and the life. That's an inaccurate translation. Jesus says, I am resurrection life. I am not a quantity of life. I'm a quality of life. And the resurrection does not start at the last day. The resurrection starts the day you believe in me. I got resurrection life right now. Hmm. I am is the resurrection. I am the bread of life. I am the water of life. I am the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. I am resurrection. The same I am that was in Exodus. When God told Moses, go tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Moses said, the people are going to want to know who you are. Who shall I tell them that you are? What is your name? He said, go tell them I am. Not I was. Not I will be. Not I am becoming. I am. Whatever you need, I am. resurrection life Jesus in his power said to Martha show me where you buried him Martha said Lord I, 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 I know you got all power but he's thinking now he's been in the grave four days Martha I suspect thinks Jesus just wants to view the body because he wasn't at the wake and, and you know how we go to see if everything looks good and we go to, we go to make sure her hair just right and make sure that her makeup is on perfect and make sure that they put on the tie that you sent he's still dead I, 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 I've never seen nobody dead look natural they look naturally dead Just, just about all the people in my family who would get mad at me for saying this are gone, so I can say this now. At, at my grandmother's wake, <laughs> they, they put her glasses on her. And, 
and, and I bust out laughing. I said, where's she going with those glasses on? My mama said, go sit your crazy. You know what she said, you know. They was trying to get her to look like herself. And she looked just like her dead self. Because dead is dead. But Jesus wasn't going there to view his body. Jesus was going there to wake him up. Because it was not until everybody recognized that a miracle needed to be performed that Jesus said, roll the stone away. Now Jesus could have just said, stone be removed but he told them to participate in the miracle. And if you want God to bless your life, he will bless your life, but you gotta get up and participate in your own miracle. You have not because you ask not. And if you ask for selfish reasons, he's not going to do it. But if you ask in his name, you can say that this mountain be removed. I wish I had a Bible reader. And it will vanish out of your sight. Jesus said, roll the stone away. And when they rolled the stone away, brothers and sisters, hear me. There was an actual man with actual grave clothes who came out of an actual grave alive. But that's not the shout. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. Hold your shout. That, 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 that ain't the hollering part. Hold your shout. Here is the shout. When Jesus got to the mouth of that grave, he did not say, come forth. Because had he just shouted, come forth, Abraham would have got up. Jacob would have got up. Isaiah would have got up. Ezekiel would have gotten up. But he said, Lazarus, come forth. And everybody who is alive in Christ today, he called you by your name and told you, come forth. Come out of darkness. Come out of pride. Come out of sinfulness. Come out of unrighteousness. And he called you by your name. but you were not ready to be all he wanted you to be till you took off your grave clothes. It was not until Lazarus came out of his grave clothes that Jesus said, loose him and let him go. I need somebody here this morning who done come out your grave clothes. You've come out of that old man you used to be. You come out of that old mean person you need to, you used to be. You come out of that sinful person you used to be. It's still a little bit left in you. You still got some of your grave clothes on, but that's why you come to church every Sunday morning. Cause you're asking God to move one more layer. Lord, I've taken this off, but I need to take something else off. Lord, I've taken that off, but I need to take something else off. You're going to help me preach, won't you? Now, you can shout still with some grave clothes on, but you'll shout better when you start taking your grave clothes off. Don't worry about who likes you. Don't worry about who's on your side. Don't worry about who's praising on your pew. You might be the only one in your section 
who came to give God praise this morning because you know you got some grave clothes you need God to remove you got some mess in your life that you need God to handle this morning you've got some problems in your life that you need God to open your eyes about you've got some enemies in your life that you don't even know about and you need God to protect you from them you've got some pitfalls in your way that you don't even know how to navigate around so you need God to lead you around the ditches that people have set for you and then you got some stuff that God has already done and you just here to tell God thank you for what you've already done thank you for the doors you've already opened thank you for the ways you've already made thank you for the prayers you've already answered thank you for the enemies you already put down thank you for the door that's open before I even get to it thank you for the joy that's coming in my life even though I'm crying right now thank you that every time I had a situation I called on your name and you came to my rescue is there anybody here know that he will show up he may not come when you want him but he's always always right on time won't he do it won't he do it now the reason why Lazarus had his grave clothes and came out the grave with his grave clothes was because he was going to need them again. Martha probably took his grave clothes, folded them up neatly, put them in a chest of drawers because Lazarus would have to use them again. But one Friday on a hill called Calvary, Jesus died on the cross. He died, didn't he die? They buried his body in a borrowed grave. He stayed there all night Friday night. He stayed there all day Saturday. He stayed there all night Saturday night. But bright early Sunday morning, he got up, but he didn't do what Lazarus did. He left his grave clothes right there in the grave because never, never, never would he have to use him again. He got up and because he got up, one of these days I'm going to get up too and leave my grave clothes right there in the grave because Jesus is getting us ready for that great day. Is there anybody here getting ready for that great day? Are you saved? Are you sanctified? Why don't you grab somebody, shake somebody's hand, tell them I'm saved and I know it. I've been born again and I know it. I've been washed in the blood and I know it. I've been redeemed. I know he's all right. He walks with me. He talks with me. He tells me his own and the joy 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 tragedies are commonplace oh 
kinds of diseases. People are slipping away. The economy is down. People can't get enough pay. But as for me, as for me, all I can say is thank you, Lord, for all you've done for me. It could have been me outdoors with no food and no clothes. All left alone without a friend. Just another number with a tragedy. But you didn't see fit. You didn't see fit to let none of these things be. I'm saved by your power and you keep on, keep on, keep on, keep on, keep on, keep on, keep on. resurrection life he that believes in me though he be dead yet shall he live and he that lives in me shall never die and Jesus asked Martha this question do you believe this Martha said, yeah, I believe. I believe that you are the son of God. And listen, before the choir sings, let me ask you. Do you believe this? The reason why I shout is because I believe this. The reason why I give God so much praise I believe this and I don't just believe with an intellectual assent I believe with a theological conviction that when he comes back I'm going back with him <laughs> 